Blood Brothers Podcast, a Five Pillars of Mad Monarchs production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers, sisters, friends, and foes out there, and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Dili Hussein. Today, I have a very esteemed guest, uh, a very celebrated figure of the Muslim community. Someone who, as a young teen, grew up watching the debates with the Christians. So I don't know what that means in terms of age for our guest. And that is none other than my dear brother, Ustad Adnan Rashid. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I am getting old. You don't look it though. You are ripping the way I was looking. Uh, you look younger on, than me. Uh, as they say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Oh, mashallah. It depends who's looking at me. Do you do any paintwork on the hair? No. So that's pure natural black? Yes. Natural beauty. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. 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 <laughs> Dama, let me kick off today's podcast by setting a scenario. You're on a boat trip hmm. on your own hmm. for seven days. And I'm going to give you two options. You have to choose one. So think of a seven day boat ride on your own. Tik? Dudh pati or pink tea? Dudh pati. Naan or roti? Roti. Chicken or lamb? Lamb. Halwa or kheer? Halwa. Books of theology or books of history? History. Seven days of Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah, or Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah? Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah, or Shah Waliullah Dalawi? Imam Ahmed. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, or Alama Iqbal? Iqbal. Dr. Zakir Naik or Dr. Israr Ahmed? Dr. Israr Ahmed. Sultan Aurangzeb or Khalif Abdul Hamid? Aurangzeb. Very interesting. Quite. Th- those responses were. I the- can qual- qualify every single one of those choices. Go- okay, so, okay, so let me- and each one of those requires a podcast in itself. Okay, so just very briefly, I can understand Imam Ahmed. The hmm. don of the Hanbali, the fan of the Hanbali. He made Hanbali. Ibn Taymiyyah. Exactly. Khalas. So why would you go to the product? So Jinnah, so when you said Alama Iqbal over Muhammad Ali Jinnah, why is that? Iqbal made Jinnah. And? Iqbal went to Jinnah and invited him to get involved in the politics. Of, of course, Jinnah was already involved, but he had given up. Iqbal inspired him to come back and lead the Muslims. And why is Thar Ahmad over Dr. Zakir Naik? Uh, because Dr. Asrar Ahmed had a deeper knowledge of the Quran than Dr. Na- Zakir Naik has. Uh, both are very valuable, of course, but doctors, uh, I would say Dr. Asrar Ahmed was a lot bigger scholar, theologically speaking, than Dr. Zakir Naik is. Now, I presented Sultan Aurangzeb mm-hmm. against Khalif Abdul Hamid, who's mm-hmm. also equally, if not a greater mm-hmm. giant mm-hmm. Yeah, of modern Islamic history. Mm-hmm. Is that because of your Mughal history bias you chose? Aurangzeb? Potentially, yes. Yeah. Uh, p- partly because of that and partly because I believe Aurangzeb achieved more than Sultan Abdul Hamid That's as a, a ruler. Yeah. As a ruler? As a ruler, yes. Okay, we can touch upon that. He had us. more control over his domain than Sultan Abdul Hamid did. Really? Yeah, Aurangzeb acquired territory, didn't lose it. Sultan Abdul Hamid unfortunately lost, lost territory. territory. This is true. Yeah. This is true. Yeah. Uh, when I met you three, four days ago, mm. at the time of the recording of this podcast, uh, there was the assassination of Iran's top military general, Qasem Soleimani, mm. uh, by uh, America. And of course, it's caused a massive controversy and, and discussion in the region and beyond about whether the death of this major general, who is considered the second most powerful person in Iran, uh, what it means for the region. Now, there's an interesting thing that you said to me, uh, it was that was he a sacrificial uh, giving uh, from Iran to America to advance its agenda in the region? Can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Firstly, let me clarify that there are two perspectives on General Soleimani. Uh, one perspective is the Iranian state perspective, not necessarily the perspective of the people. Uh, the state perspective is that he was a hero of Islam. He fought for Iranian interest in the region. He was heading many conflicts on the part of uh, the Iranian government mm. in Yemen, mm. in Syria, in Iraq, most importantly. And for that reason, he was a hero for the Iranian regime, the current Iranian regime. Mm. I separate the people from the regime because the people uh, can... Uh, can differ with the regime, mm. and many do, as we know from uh, recent events, that there were protests in Iran 
many thousands were killed mm. uh, depending on perspe- perspectives again depending on who's reporting uh it could be hundreds it could be thousands and at the same time um people can be on on the side of the regime mm. as we know hundreds of thousands turned up uh, for his funeral it was so massive. he was he was clearly very popular mm. among hundreds of thousands of people so that cannot be ignored that's one perspective that he was a hero he did his job to the best of his ability mm. he gave his life the best part of his life to the cause of the Iranian revolution uh, which started in 1979 and this is one perspective the other perspective is the larger regional if you call it the sunni perspective okay the sunni perspective on this per- person is uh, completely the opposite that he butchered hundreds of thousands of people in syria he's uh, responsible for the conflict in yemen um which is causing hundreds of thousands of deaths because of starvation because of uh, other limits or other problems caused by war in that region he was responsible for killings of sunnis in iraq and when i say sunnis i don't mean isis of course the credit uh, must be given where it's due iran must be credited by uh, for uh, fighting isis but there is okay. a conflation with mm. certain pro iran elements where fighting daesh literally becomes a justification of cleansing sunni towns and villages right Well it did uh, for some reason unfortunately in Iraq and these reports cannot be ignored because this is not uh, rhetoric or this is not just uh, r- r- these are not rumors no no human rights watch issued issued exactly reports exactly on, on, on Iraq death squads yeah. and there were Iranian Mos- militias Mosul Mosul Ambar entire towns the, the backlash out. fell on innocent sunni inhabitants of Mosul and Baghdad yeah. and even uh, places like Fallujah mm. okay people who had no, nothing to do with war mm. uh, in general and they were treated as ISIS mm. but if you looked at the reality um um carefully under- if you looked at the reality carefully those people hated ISIS as much as anyone else would do mm. right so fighting ISIS does not become a justification to completely eradicate uh, Sunni influence or existence from Iraq okay so these are some of the things he was uh, seen to have done mm. and this is the sunni perspective which i have come to you know uh, read recently on uh, online and offline in newspapers and news reports mm. many documentaries have come out since he has passed away so he has left two legacies behind depending on who's looking at him the iranian regime or people who support the iranian regime perspective and the other perspective is the largest sunni uh, world, uh, world world perspective where people see him as a war criminal mm. as a murderer as a mass murderer so how, it depends how would you then respond to then in that mm. case when we've had the likes of Recep Tayyip Erdogan who sent his condolences uh, mm-hmm. to Iran reportedly referred to Soleimani as a shaheed uh we had Hamas uh, Ismail Haniyeh who was there at the funeral himself and certain resistance groups within Pak Palestine who have voiced their support and condolences um we've had um no real voice of opposition and condemnation from any Sunni leadership mm-hmm. yes from the masses sure yeah. the people of Idlib were celebrating they were giving sweets out even Iraq yeah, yeah. even the Shias in Iraq were celebrating really yes it was reported by al jazeera there are people on the streets of baghdad celebrating his death shias these are not sunnis mm. because there are shia people in iraq who want iran out and so, soleimani's death meant that uh, this would potentially cause iran to leave, uh, leave iraq but we've not yeah. really had any vo- the, the position that you've presented mm-hmm. uh, which is widely seen as the sunni position which by the way i tend to agree with mm-hmm. right but nevertheless plain devil's advocate we've not seen any voice of sunni leadership come out and say this man just, was a criminal just to clarify by the way i do not agree with any extrajudicial killing by anyone anywhere in the world yeah so by that virtue the the killing the assassination was an act of barbarity it was unlawful in my personal opinion no no it's, it's okay. legit opinion. i don't i don't i don't believe donald trump's uh, justification for uh, what he did okay uh, this man had worked previously with america mm. he iran was an ally of the us in iraq both 
entities were fighting ISIS collectively. Iran was doing the dirty work of the US in uh, Iraq. So what if so, you made them turn then? What do I, you do, I, don't, I don't know if uh, they have turned against each other. I, I, I don't believe it. Okay, I, not, okay not necessarily yeah. turn, but what do, you, what do you think triggered the assassination of Qasem Soleimani? This is a very good question. Mm. I don't always believe what I hear on the news. Mm. I mean, I take uh, a lot of the news I hear on mainstream channels with a pinch of salt. Mm. One of the commentators, uh, uh, his name is Bashar, um, from, um, he's a very big uh, Middle East uh, expert on Al Jazeera, I don't know if you know him, Marwan, I think his name is Marwan Bashar. Go on, we can slip uh, his name at the bottom of this. Yeah, screen. yeah. He, he came up with a very interesting theory that this could be a reason why Iran would have a risk respite in the region because Iran was losing hold, um, its hold on power mm. uh, because the people were rising against the regime in Iran, mm. within Iran, as we have seen by recent protests, and people were rising against Iranian influence in Iraq. So, this could be a way of bringing the nation together. Er, yes, uh, raising the nationalistic feeling, yeah. uh, death to America, death to America slogans. And therefore, again, and, therefore again, and that, that unites the nation. Hundreds of thousands of people will come uh, together um, at the funeral and they will express their condolences for the family as well as the regime mm. for losing such a powerful man, such mm. an important figure of the regime. And this will raise the feeling of nationalism and it will inflate the feeling of hatred against the US and that would strengthen the regime mm. uh, by extension. This was a possible interpretation of the events. But I'm not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Mm. I'm just trying to make sense of it. Okay. That how can suddenly things go bitter? How, can they go, how can they go bitter like what's that? Your, they, what's your view on the 22 missile attacks which killed no American soldiers? Well, my view is uh, <laughs> very much inclined to what some of the reports have stated that Iran intentionally, intentionally fired missiles uh, at a facility where there, were, there was no, no one there, mm. as if to deliberately avoid casualties so that mm. the US does not retaliate with a bigger, mm. uh, you know, I, uh, attack. I think there's definitely more, way more to this incident mm. than, than what meets the eye, yes. right? Yes. Um, there is no shadow of a doubt that Iran has played a key role in the region, which in, in some instances was in absolute accordance with American policy within the region, yeah. the fall of Taliban, the fall of Saddam. These are two uh, wars which actually strengthened uh, the, the Iranian government and its position within the region. However, we are still left with a wide perception that Iran is the bulwark and the, rep and, and, and the symbol of anti-imperialism in the region, right? And this is echoed by their support, material and financial of the Palestinian resistance, uh, namely Islamic Jihad and Hamas. Um, and there's still many Sunnis who subscribe to this, this, this um, thinking. For example, I was looking at the Pakistani press and I was looking at Pakistani commentators and they were very mournful over the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the Dawn, the Jung newspaper. It was mixed. In Pakistan, the reaction was mixed. But there was a fair amount, of the, at least from the liberal establishment, yes. right? Th yes. that, that Qasem Soleimani's yes. assassination was something that was bad yes. and it should be condemned. So there is still this perception that I, I, Even I say that. Mm. I, I say that any extrajudicial killing conducted by anyone is to be condemned. So it we, is unlawful. So we, 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 we live, or we at least we claim to live in a civilized world which is governed by laws, international laws. And those laws cannot be transgressed. Uh, just because someone is powerful doesn't mean you can do what you want. But you may hate someone, you may hate someone, but there is a due process of law. We have to follow it. Isn't right? it frustrating that the lawmakers themselves are the ones that always break the yes. law? Yes, I mean, I was shocked when Trump said that he will potentially bomb uh, cultural, cultural sites, sites, which is absolutely shocking. Mm. This is what ISIS was doing. Mm. I mean, I was really devastated when I saw ISIS uh, raiding some of these historic sites. Being Palmyra a historian, and, yeah. being a student of history, you yeah. can imagine what I went through, right? Yeah. Of course, the human loss is one thing, um, okay? But history cannot be made again, mm. okay? History, it, it cannot be reinvented, okay? If you have lost historical objects, if you have lost historical evidence, it is lost forever. You will never recover it again, mm. unfortunately. So I was devastated by that. For the US, president to make a statement like that, mm. it was very shocking for myself, right? So um, law cannot be break, br broken. Uh, you can't break the law uh, when you feel that you hate someone and you want to take action and you want to really hurt them. 
by attacking the cultural sites or attacking the civilians for that matter or attacking hospitals and and you know schools and uh, you know civilian institutions this is not this this is not allowed this shouldn't be allowed in fact the the world should unite against such behavior do you think sunnis yeah. at least in syria and iraq and those who have felt the brunt mm. of the iranian regimes uh policies in those countries do you think we should support a, uh, an american led war against iran i don't think we support we should support any power in that region we should support peace okay harmony uh we what we what we should ask for is um dismantling of arms foreign armies leaving those lands going back to their homelands leaving this region to itself and let the leaders of these regions decide what the fate of the region is uh we have too many players foreign players testing their weapons on innocent people we have russia in there we have the us in there we have britain in there uh, we have france in there okay these are very powerful nations with deadly weapons and some of them are actually testing their weapons on this region we are not guinea pigs people of this region the muslims have had enough so they must leave the region and there shouldn't be a war we shouldn't take sides against anyone no matter how much we hate we might hate one party for example against the other and we might we might start thinking of supporting one party against the other we shouldn't do that okay again what's going to happen the powerful they won't suffer trump will be in his office the iranian regime the 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 current iranian political establishment they won't be harmed it's the people it's the innocent people in iran in iraq or in uh, the middle wider middle east they're going to suffer they will be bombed they will be starved they will be like what's happening in yemen right now so this is why i believe iran should pull out of yemen it should pull out of syria it should pull out of uh, iraq and let there be peace mm. okay i believe both of these powers have caused immense damage to the peace of the region tick now obviously moving a bit more closer to home uh india now since modi ji has been in power uh, india has taken quite a nasty turn right uh, where many of these sentiments these anti muslim islamophobic sentiments what i would humbly argue were always there in indian society has now become very apparent and the ugly underbelly of kind of a hindutva rss kind of ideology uh, has now become very apparent uh, especially in state policy so we've had the citizenship amendment act which basically states that any migrants or refugees from pakistan bangladesh or afghanistan uh, that are hindu sikh jain or christian will be given citizenship explicitly excluding muslims then we've had the national register of citizenship which was rolled out in assam uh potentially looking at 1.9 million people predominantly muslims of bengali uh, ethnicity that going to be in detention camps uh, last year earlier on we had the revoking of article 370 and 35a in kashmir and within a space of a year we're seeing all these kind of policies what is the future looking like for muslims of india which numbers more than bangladesh and pakistan the future looks very grim yeah. and this is the future the founding fathers of pakistan could envision in uh the the earlier part of the 20th century they could see this coming hence the necessity of pakistan that's why pakistan and bangladesh was created because those founding fathers could not trust the majority hindu rule um because it it, it could go anywhere it could go towards secularism which it did for a mm. few decades mm. or it could also go towards extreme right wing Um, Hindu nationalism Hindu nationalism which is what we see right now which is what we seeing right now the rise of Hindu nationalism mm. and Modi had a landslide victory and democracy has failed unfortunately mm. and we, it has failed globally are we saying democracy has failed let's say talk about india are we, are we saying democracy has failed because the indians chose their leader in landslide no i'm saying democracy has failed as a system globally okay if this is what democracy is if this is what it does then it has to be reviewed okay if democracy brings people like modi to power mm. okay someone who was accused of uh, genocide in gujarat, gujarat in 2003 yes. 
if democracy can bring someone like Trump to power, who was accused of abusing women and using vulgar language mm-hmm. against uh, All kinds minorities, of women, and blacks, disability, and blacks, Mexicans, Hispanic, and Muslims, and everyone. He, he has hurt every single entity on the planet. But he's okay. re- but he is representative of a large constituency of his voters. Well, this is why Iqbal, mm. the philosopher of the East, Rahimahullah. stated Rahimahullah yeah. in a very powerful uh, stanza mm. that. ایک مرد فرنگی نے کیا مجھ پہ راز یہ فاش کہ ہر چند دانا اسے کھولا نہیں کرتے جمہوریت جو طرز حکومت ہے اس میں بندوں کو گنا کرتے ہیں تولا نہیں کرتے ٹرانسلیشن پلیز ٹرانسلیشن از دیٹ این انگلش مین این انگلش مین ہی ایکسپوز دس سیکرٹ ٹو می ایز ناٹ ویری آفٹن دا وائز ریویل اٹ ٹو ادرز دیٹ ڈیموکریسی از اے وے آف گورننگ ان وچ You count people, you don't weigh them. So when you start counting, when a philosopher's vote or when a, when a scholar's vote is equal to someone to who is, who's, yeah, uh, so, some, like, this is the same uh, what, what Plato criticized in democracy uh, in his Republic. Okay? The Republic is one of the best critiques of democracy. Okay. It is one of the best critiques of democracy. This is what he said, that in, in, in a de- democratic system, Someone who has no knowledge, has no awareness. His vote is equal to that equal of a Equal to thinker. someone who is a thinker, someone who, has, who, is, who is educated, someone who is a philosopher. This is not fair. This is absolutely devastating. And this is exactly what we're seeing right now. In this system, the current system we have in the world, masses can be manipulated by newspapers, by power, by money, by glitter, by spectacle, mm. right? And they can be conditioned into voting for... some of the worst people in the society. Mm. And this is exactly what we're seeing right now. Okay, we're seeing um, the, the embodiment of that failure of democracy in, if, these, in these people. If you could have the ears of the leadership of different Indian and Muslim communities, whether it be ulama, whether it be political leaders, if you had their ears for five minutes, mm. what advice would you give them from your own perspective as a historian as someone who follows the events of the region quite closely mm-hmm. uh, in terms of uh, I, i know it's very for me to say adnan rashid give an action plan for the muslims of india is quite crazy but mm. if you could share some thoughts mm. with the leadership of the muslims of india yeah. regarding the current situation what would it be without rubbing in their face like, hey look this is yeah. what pakistan was because yeah. i'm seeing that a lot yeah i'm seeing a number of commentators and even lay muslims who are from pakistan that hey look this was the wisdom of uh, jinnah sahab and look this is what pakistan was created etc yeah. and i and, and i feel that's a bit whilst you can appreciate that from a hindsight perspective When Muslims of India are literally being lynched up and down the country yes, they are, To yeah. tell them, by the way guys, look, this is why Pakistan was created I feel yeah. that's a bit, you know, just rubbing salt on the wound And it yeah. could even make them entrenched even further in We are proud to be a Muslim so what, right. so what could you potentially tell the Muslims of India, their leadership With regards to I, I would uh, tell them, immediately unite mm. Unite without delay And do not stop your movement Do not be um, discouraged by accusations, by misrepresentations of the regime against the Muslims and unite with the non-Muslims mm. because there are many non-Muslims in India who are very moral, ethical, they are very upright in the politics and they are the ones who are defending the Muslims now. Muslims have effectively become second-class citizens after the passing of this bill. Mm. Now, by law, Muslims are now second-class citizens. Quite, yeah, literally. Well, the, the, literally, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If you are passing a law and you, you are completely um, excluding. ignoring, excluding yeah. Yeah. an entire minority from a country, from the a largest large country, minority. the, the largest, largest minority, minority, which runs into hundreds of millions, yeah. if you are excluding them from a law, you are discriminating against them um, based upon religion. they become effectively second-class citizens. Mm. People talk about ISIS, people are talking about Taliban videos mm. from the 90s where they were beating people in the streets and there was so much noise about that mm. on CNN, on NBC, Fox News, BBC, mm. Sky News, all of these international channels are running shows, mm. talk shows, debates 
uh, on the barbarity of the of the East. For months okay, on for end. Example. Absolutely. For months it on hasn't end. stopped. <laughs> right? There are lynching videos coming out of India. There are people who are being killed and they are th these people are not even hiding their faces, mm. those who are doing the killings. Right? They are killing in the name of Hinduism and they are not one, two, three. There's many. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of people who actually sympathize with that view. Mm. India needs to be reconditioned. The minds of the people in India, they need to be reconditioned. They need to be re-educated because they have been radicalized. Mm. They have been, they are Hindu ISIS. Mm. I'm sorry to use the language, mm. but they are Hindu ISIS. They are Hindu Nazis. The current regime governing India, the BJP uh, regime. But, 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 with, but, but with the comparison, I know why you made the comparison, but ISIS, let's be frank about it, is still a fringe, beyond fringe. Absolutely. Whereas this is mainstream. Yes, unfortunately, that's the problem. This is mainstream. That's the problem. This is why it's more dangerous. ISIS was never okay. mainstream. This is an alarming situation. ISIS ideology, their fiqh, their whatever it was, has never been rejected. It's been rejected. It has been rejected by 99.9% .9 of Whereas the Muslims. Whereas Hindutva, RSS, BJP ideology is wide, mainstream. Has a wide support from Canada from the US. Why are these people not? Okay, look, in the West, Muslims are always taunted. Mm. Why don't you do enough against extreme? And we are screaming and shouting from our mosques, mm. from the pulpit, yep, yep. from uh, our scholars to our lay people are saying, hold on, these people are your product. They have nothing to do with our civilization. Mm. ISIS is not our civilization I've produced. Not seen, I've not seen that from Hindu representative groups. Generally they are speaking, openly not, celebrating yes. the the. It's like Hitler when he came to power yeah. in 1933. Yep. Okay, you can call it a sham election or yeah. you know whatever. You know it was a rigged election or it was influenced. He still had a massive constituency. Uh, yeah, absolutely, he he was very popular as yeah. a leader. That yeah. doesn't make him right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, likewise, on a bigger scale, unfortunately, what's happening in this case, in the case of India and BJP governing India. Mm. Okay. It is very clear some of the major players, some of the major ministers and politicians are using extremely vulgar, divisive, genocidal language against the Muslim population, mm. if not others. Mm. Okay, People like uh, Yogi Adity Adityanath, yes. okay? the, the, the chief minister, the CM of Uttar Pradesh, the mm. largest province of yeah. India. Mm. That province alone has as much population as Pakistan has. Mm. Uh, you know, it's over 200 million people mm. in that particular pro province. Mm. He is governing the largest population in India. He is clearly, openly making genocidal statements, biased, prejudiced statements. He's justifying his behavior. He's justifying the police. We have seen the videos coming out where police in this particular province is going into Muslim properties, smashing cars, throwing stones, shout, stone, shout, shouting, raping, terrorizing, yeah, yeah. terrorizing a population of millions. Mm. We're not talking about a neighborhood. We're not mm. talking about a town. Mm. We're talking about millions of people are being terrorized systematically by the state apparatus. Mm. We have thousands of policemen walking into Muslim neighborhoods, smashing properties, cars, uh, houses, windows, walking into homes, beating people up, women yep. and children. Yep. We have seen all these videos come yeah, out. No yeah. one can deny. Thanks to social media, yeah. thanks to Facebook and yeah, YouTube yeah. and all that. Okay, all of this has come out. They cannot deny. We it, saw right? what happened in Aligarh Muslim University, Jamia yeah. Islamia um, University, yeah. where and they were going into campuses. They, they, was, they were beating up peaceful protesters. And Juan Al Nehru yes, uh, yes, University recently, well. recently as well. Recently, yes, recently, where Mars some of the thugs. Indian celebrities. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, they have come out, some of the, uh, some of the actors, mm. they have come out and they supported. So a lot of good people, moral people, uh, are supporting Muslims in this. Muslims should take full advantage of this uh, to, for, for, for the goodness of India. Mm. We, what do we want for India? We the Muslims globally, the Ummah, what do we want for India? India is a beautiful country. Mm. It is uh, rich in history. Muslims governed India uh, for nearly a thousand years parts of India mm. and Muslims govern India with love mm. although there are haters on the other side who claim that India was devastated by Muslim invasions India was mistreated by Muslims Indian populations were devastated colonized uh, looted, co looted oppressed yep. yeah oppressed all of that mm. but let me tell you something just to just to you know refute this particular claim Muslim sultans during the Delhi Sultanate period who are Mamluks, right? The, the Mamluks yeah. of India, right? They were Muslims 
and they were the most powerful entities politically speaking and militarily speaking in india mm. uh, for almost two centuries okay if not more the 13th and the 14th century both centuries much of these centuries was spent by the sultans defending india against mongols against the mongols the mongols invaded india at times on yearly basis mm. sometimes monthly basis mm. mongols did not disappear mm. sultan ghiasuddin balban right he lost his son in a battle against mm. mongols mm. his heir apparent someone who was supposed to succeed his father and he never recovered from this yeah. loss so the sultan died in uh, 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 grieving for his son right then came the khiljis okay khiljis fought the mongols okay people can claim oh they were defending their own government their own mm. power but no mm. no 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 they were defending india you can't because there were hindus mm. in the armies mm. this was this was not a purely muslim establishment the delhi sultanate had hindu, had hindu, hindu generals fighting side the same with the moguls mm. the moguls had hindu rajput mm. and jat at times mm. generals fighting side by side with the moguls against the enemies okay some of the major some of the biggest generals in the mogul armies were were hindus so how do you counter the fact that whilst they were defending india against mongols yeah. and foreign invaders that when they weren't doing that they were too busy uh, isolating and, and and disenfranchising and oppressing hindus that they, when they weren't doing if, that they if would... they were oppressing hindus why would they have hindus in their armies as generals it's a good question isn't it mm. it's a question if they were oppress- were those hindus siding with them no mm. these these were times very very disturbing times barbaric times uncivilized times there were no international there was no international law governing countries and kings and armies mm. okay and if you look at the muslim period okay comparatively it was a lot more peaceful uh, when you look at the larger scale okay of course muslims never had peace in this region and it was, and it was never utopian ages, the middle ages were full of wars rebellions and there was no such period as a utopian period no no there's so no utopia there is no utopia yeah, absolutely it doesn't yeah. exist yeah. what we have to see is we have to see the behavior of the muslim sultans comparatively mm. uh against uh, those who who were there in india mm. uh you know for example from the hindu background mm. okay because hindu hindus were the majority even then so muslims did not have this policy of uh, oppressing or suppressing hindus they never had this policy in fact this is why some of the founding fathers of pakistan having studied the history of india carefully they knew any time unfortunately some who, of the hindus would, came to power who would you regard as the founding fathers of pakistan beyond muhammad ali jinnah who were the founding I fathers i would say who? if you were to go back in history i would say shah wali ullah laid the foundations okay okay he gave the political theory okay to the muslims of india how to govern effectively how to govern justly very importantly in his books like hujjatullah al baligha and his uh, uh, you know encyclopedia called izalatul khifa an khilafatil khulafa where mm. he uh, defended the concept of khilafa mm. in islam and what an ideal khilafa should look like mm. you know just because someone claims to be a khalifa doesn't make him a khalifa like mm. isis caliphate is mm. not a caliphate we Far don't accept it. it as a caliphate Course not. okay they claimed it mm. if you wear a badge that mm. i'm a surgeon or Do, i'm doesn't I'm make you surgeon i mean it does if you if you if you if you're a cobbler yeah okay if you some if you're someone who, who's a butcher from an abattoir mm. okay and you claim to be a surgeon yeah. just by by the virtue of cutting things up yeah. right you don't become a surgeon you're a butcher right yeah. likewise chawalullah he gave a proper theory of a proper caliphate anyone else okay uh, at that time in india it's just a bit like a Over a I mean, period. I mean, if you go back, of course, there are so many other individuals: uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam mm. Al-Mawardi, mm. and uh, Imam Ghazali. Okay, forget about, about more to more towards the 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 theory that Pakistan or there should be a separate state for Muslims to Sh- survive Sh- in this Sh- region. Shah Waliullah did not necessarily talk about the separation. Okay, he talked about the necessity of holding on to power mm. to maintain peace and justice. His view was that if Muslims governed by the rules of Islam. properly india will become a peaceful abode not only for muslims but non-muslims 
ഡെമോക്രസിഡ് <laughs> <laughs> they would leave it as a democracy and therefore, a dem- democracy. And therefore demographically against demographically muslims would be worse off and uh, muslims would have lost severely and th- these arguments that collectively muslims of bangladesh and pakistan and what we have in india mm. they would have outdone the hindus democratically uh, and they would have been a big power this, this this argument doesn't work because muslims were and are demographically so sparse in india that they cannot effectively make a change to this day how many muslim mps do we have in the indian parliament we have nearly 300 million muslims in india mm. they are all they are all divided they are all divided demographically mm. uh, not necessarily ideologically but demographically they are all in different places okay that's why they can they cannot have an impact de- uh, democratically they have to vote for hindu candidates mm. those who favor them national congress or bjp uh, yes exactly mm. they have to vote for them because mm. they have no other option mm. a muslim candidate would simply not win because the majority wouldn't vote for him majority is either on the side of congress which is secular liberal type hindus mm. okay or the extreme right wing ultra you know ultra nationalist uh, hindus voting for someone like bjp so people are very naive when they claim that if muslims were to be in a democracy and i i don't agree with the 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 jamaat e islam yeah yeah jamaat e islami or the scholars of deoband mm. that we we would have been better off no mm. i believe iqbal people like iqbal sir sayed jina they knew better they knew better they knew what was coming they knew a train was heading their way and it was going to hit them so hard that they would never be able to recover like what's happening in india mm. how much difference have the muslims unfortunately have made in india not because muslims are incompetent mm. not because muslims are incapable but, muslims are but, very but purely due to opportunity not much at all uh, no because they are marginalized systematically mm. marginalized from politics but they can but, but but indian muslims can easily turn around and say well look at the bloody state of pakistan pakistan itself is not is also can be argued that it's a failed state okay in pakistan as f- failure as failed a state it might be yeah. okay i don't be- i don't believe it's a failed state it's a nuclear power which is still standing firmly on its feet okay it's enduring all the challenges it's surrounded by enemies okay uh, and uh, it has effectively you know it's got survived a-, a very dangerous war in afghanistan okay uh, which it also played a key role in uh, yes absolutely it had to for its survival mm. of course what do you do There's there's a, there's a Russian generals are saying we will have our dinner at in Karachi. No, no, no. okay. T- okay. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is yeah. that Indian Muslims can easily posit back to our brothers in Pakistan yeah. that you talk about this great freedom of being Muslim or being mm. a land for the park. Mm. How did 1971 work out for you when your own brothers okay. split away from let me, let me just cut this. So, so, yeah. so how did that work out? Go mm. speak to your brothers in Bengal. Mm-hmm. How did the concept of an Islamic Pakistan work out for them? Your economy at the moment is in tatters. Um uh, you may be a nuclear state but it appears that you don't really have much control over when you press that button. It's just there to flex your muscle against India. Pakistan um, you got Imran Khan currently who initially appeared to be a, fr- uh, a breath of fresh air from previous administrations but nevertheless he's going around with the begging bowl asking for money and handouts from- so who are you as a muslim from pakistan to tell us indians that we're in tatters and we're okay. in a dire situation very good questions valid points all mm. of them are valid points and they may be true mm. pakistan is economically um, weak mm. pakistan is politically uh struggling mm. pakistan is uh, not a model state for the muslim ummah to follow no doubt it mm. has many weaknesses many mm. many problems okay i feel a butt um, coming sorry i feel a butt yeah but <laughs> at the same time at the same time in pakistan you don't have muslims being lynched for slaughtering a cow you have muslims worshiping as they like as divided as they may be or as divided as they are in mm. Pakistan there is sectarianism in Pakistan mm. there has been shia sunni sectarianism in Pakistan it mm. has caused problems in the recent past there has But been army brutality uh, in the in the tribal areas unfortunately yes there there has been some brutality which has caused some but this brutality was against elements who were trying to completely dismantle the state 
They were completely, they were against uh, the idea of Pakistan. They were trying to destroy the country from within and they were working for foreign powers. So in order to handle them, the army had to, they couldn't, you can't just sit around. I mean, if, you, if you're the guard of a building and you can see someone putting fire to the building, you have to do something, right? And in the process, unfortunately, uh, um, no doubt, military made mistakes, no doubt. I'm not a spokesperson for the military. Take, that's fine. I'm not a spokesperson for the, the government of Pakistan. They have a lot of improve, uh, improvements to do. There's a lot to improve, but Pakistan still has its Islamic identity. Muslims can walk the streets of Pakistan without fear of persecution. Muslim, Islam, Pakistan basically represents the civilization of Islam in India, which goes back a thousand years. Okay, which goes Pakistan. I mean, sometimes it's funny to think about it. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with this kind of rhetoric and language. But even the missiles, if you look at the Pakistani military apparatus, okay, mm. uh, what what are they called? They're all, okay. na they're all named after named great after Islamic figures. Muslim heroes. And they're religion. not necessarily heroes. Mm. Mm. I mean, I don't believe Ghaznavi, Sultan Mahmoud Ghaznavi was necessarily mm. a, a hero of Islam. Mm. Okay? He was a king who was yeah. doing what he, he kings was, do. What exactly? What kings loot, do. Loot, yeah. raid, uh, <laughs> accumulate wealth, money, and make yourself mm. powerful mm. and uh, and recruit armies mm. to become more powerful. Likewise, Ghoris. They were doing the same thing. Mm. The daily sultans were doing this. They mm. were not. We're not saying they were angels. Mm. So when we try, we, when we try to paint them, as, romanticize them, and we try, we try to paint them as waliullahs mm. on the musalla mm. crying at night. Mm. They were not like that. Some of them mm. used to drink. Mm. Some of them were, be, but they had a lot of ghira for Islam. Mm. You cannot take that away from them. Okay. How do we know that? Look at the coins. Mm. Look at the coins. The language on the coins. Okay. You don't have that language today in. Uh, 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 on any coins from the Muslim world, you go to the currency. Of course, Saudi Arabia is an, exa is, is an exception because the, 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 the flag has the Shahada, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I should they should reconsider mm. because the flag is being desecrated and it's being of used course. for you know different all people, kinds of things, yeah, all right? kinds of things and uh, and that disrespects the Shahada. Mm. Okay, but if you look at the Muslim currency today, uh, hardly any country has verses on the Quran or the name of the the, the central uniting entity uh, the caliph mm. okay for example daily sultanate coins okay if you pick them up you will have the name of the caliph the abbasid, Even caliph. Post, yeah, abbasid caliph mm. mustasim mm. okay al hakim billah for example mm. his name is there on the coins mm. and these guys are in they have never seen the caliph mm. right but to maintain the islamic identity and their attachment with the the wider muslim civilization mm. they represented islam and muslims of course, in a very imperfect way in India. Mm. Okay, they were not perfect. Coming back to the problems uh, of Pakistan. Yeah, problems of Pakistan. They are there, of course. Like okay. don't throw. So the, so the saying of don't throw stones in a in a in a glass house kind it, of thing. Yeah? Okay, I I accept that. But at the same time, if you do a comparison between current day India and current day Pakistan, I can tell you with confidence, in Pakistan, you will not see the lynching of Hindus. There are hundreds of thousands of Hindus in Pakistan, in the province of Sindh. If a Muslim mob was to attack a Hindu village, you know who would fight against them? Muslims probably. Pakistani Muslims mm. from all over the country mm. would rally to support the Hindus. Okay, this rhetoric on Indian news channels you hear that oh, a Hindu girl was kidnapped mm. and she was forced into Islam. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to hide their crimes, uh, crimes that are being committed by the current BJP government in India. Uh, some of the, those crimes are genocidal. Yeah, they yeah. are openly xenophobic, Islamophobic and uh, barbaric acts of uh, violence against Muslims happening in India. To hide those crimes, what they do is they magnify um, one or two isolated uh, uh, incidents. Isol isolated incidents in Pakistan, mm. for example. Okay, it is true there have been miscarriages of justice in mm. Pakistan, mm. possibly against minorities. It is true it happens. Mm. It is a huge country, but you what you will not find in Pakistan is a genocide against the minorities. For example, what happened in Gujarat in two thousand and three, what happened against the Sikhs in nineteen eighty four, okay, what is happening against Dalits, okay. Uh, or what is happening against Muslims now, where there is a mob and a Muslim man is being tortured. People are standing by and watching the torture. Sometimes with police even present. There. Police, police uh, present. Mm. You would never see that in Pakistan, fortunately. I'll give you proof for that. Recently, 
less than 10 days ago there was a man who uh, uh, basically incited violence against the Sikhs in Nankana Sahib in Punjab Pakistan mm. Pakistani side of Punjab mm. okay and he took a mob of uh, Muslims of course these people are very ignorant mm. they are they are farmers and peasants you know mm. who work the fields and they mm. don't know better mm. okay mm. they were unfortunately led by this person and he went to the Gurdwara which is a Sikh holy shrine mm. in uh, Nankana Sahib which mm. is close very close to Lahore mm. and was this where Guru uh, Nanak was born yes okay that's the city and yep. and they were shouting slogans against yep. the Sikhs and they were threatening the Sikhs mm. he was immediately locked up he was picked up by the state mm. okay because it happened so quickly you know today social media something yeah. happened before the police arrives cameras already yeah, there yeah, it's yeah. live on Facebook yeah, and people yeah. think nothing, nothing go and see what happened to him not only that the state uh, actually uh, Imran Khan tweeted about this mm. he said he said the difference between us and what the Indian government is doing is that we took action against someone who was trying to inspire or instigate violence against the Sikh community and we the state protected the community mm. On the other hand, we have CMs and Prime Ministers mm. and, um, you know... Uh, of India. Of India making statements, open, openly Islamophobic, mm. xenophobic statements against a minority and not doing anything effective against lynchings and violence against Muslims. So, so thankfully in Pakistan, we have security for Muslims and for non-Muslims. I am telling you, me as a person, as a Muslim living in Britain, who happens to come from Pakistan, if there was violence against Christians or Hindus in Pakistan, leave violence alone. Even if, someone's to, if someone was to make speeches against Hindus or Sikhs, I would be one of the first people to arrive back in that country and I would be making public uh, you know, speeches. Making, I would be organizing protests against such elements. Mm -hmm. Okay. In Pakistan, you do not have anything like that. So, so what you hear on the news on in, in, in India mm. is all lies, all exaggerated, magnified, mm. just to hide their own crime. So I posit the question to you back again, back to the, yeah. why has the ideology yeah. of Hindu supremacy mm. uh, become exacerbated and popularized of late? Why has it garnered so much support? Okay. Because it has. Okay. We, we can't even call it a 50-50 situation. I call it jahl, mm. ignorance. Ignorance. The masses, the poor people of India living in the rural areas, they are very poor, very ignorant about anything in life apart from their farming and their, their villages. Wanting okay. a Hindu Rashta, mm. is there any theological historical basis from your knowledge of a kind of Hindu state, a purist state? No. As it, as it's, so it's, it's, it's a very recent idea which was instigated by the British. The British divided Muslims and Hindus on communal communal lines mm. to be able to govern india okay they 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 couldn't afford the hindus and muslims uniting mm. uh, against the british rule mm. and when they did uh, lo and behold we had independence yeah. okay uh, even in the indian mutiny 1857 it was hindus and muslims hindus and muslims fought yeah. against the british yeah. to uh, to gain independence so the british more than anyone else understood that hindus and muslims have to be divided they have to divide for them to be able to govern India uh, for longer and they created Hinduism now you may be thinking hold on a second what, what are you saying British the British created Hinduism I am saying the British created Hinduism Hinduism as in an ideology as as, as an idea to stand against uh, stand against uh, Islamic identity Hindus are divided previously firstly Hindu is a Persian word it is not even uh, a Hindu word. Not from Sanskrit. Uh, it's, not, it's not Sanskrit. No, no. Okay. Hindu is a Persian word which was used by Persian chroniclers and writers okay, throughout the Mughal period and beyond. Right? So, Hindus are divided into Rajputs, Jats, okay, um, Marathas. Okay, this is how they were called. Brahmins. Brahmins. Mm. Okay, so the, the, uh, Brahmins are basically castes. Okay, mm. Brahmins, uh, uh, Kashtari, Way, Shudar, these are four castes. Shudars are the lowest caste who were doing the cleaning work and all that and they were the not allowed to... The point from your reading of history yeah. and from your research or knowledge of this area, has there ever been a time in India where there was a purist Hindu rule? Like, like we... Never. Like, like if you speak to Muslims, you can say under Khulafat al-Rashidin, under... Uh, it was Uyya. attempted. It was attempted by the Marathas. Okay. Okay. 
the marathas were a devastating force in india uh, well they celebrate it now these days uh, they are celebrated for the wrong reasons if you knew the history of the marathas marathas mm. were killing as many hindus as they were killing muslims marathas are not india loving uh, entity in fact we have evidence to the contrary that muslim sultans they loved india more than the marathas absolutely the muslim sultans who are seen as outsiders mm. they were more local they were more they were more of more of sons of the land than the marathas but were. the marathas are being celebrated now because in bollywood movies of, in entertainment in, in academia in, in, they are now being yeah, celebrated in movies like in movies like uh, ahmed chab the panipat yes. which is a recent production recent movie, yep. then baji rao and mustani yep. and then we have uh, even uh, even another movie um, about Khala- alauddin khilji was uh, padmavati yes padmavati okay. yeah okay so these hindu rulers of the past whether they are maratha or rajputs mm. are being celebrated erroneously as okay. part of this wider agenda uh, absolutely to to give rise to this hindu nationalistic feeling mm. and to justify it somehow historically there is no historical justification i'm a student of history i read scholars and i uh, I told that line, scholarly line. I'm, I, I, I hope I'm not biased and prejudiced. But it's a massive you, claim to say that the Marathas don't represent a sentiment of a purist Hindu state. No, they don't. Why? Because they were destroying. They were. They. Who? Firstly, we have to understand when we study the history of the Marathas. Yeah. Who was fighting the Marathas? The the Mughals were fighting Mar- Marathas. This the, is the misconception. The Afga- the, Af- the Rajputs the, were fighting the Marathas. So were the Mughals. Uh, so were the Mughals. So, so were the, the Jats. Yeah. And so were the Hindus of Bengal. The Hind- Marathas invaded Bengal mm. so many times, and they were simply coming to burn villages, to loot, pollute, and rape. They were notoriously known for raping. Not to spread Hindu rule. No, no, no. There was nothing about uh, Marathas had Muslim generals. In the Battle of Panipat, mm. they had a Muslim general mm. on their side. Okay. Yes, and uh, Ahmed Shah Abdali had Hindus fighting on his side, so there was no Hindu. Uh, of course, there was the religious sentiment that was used. Okay, from the the Muslim side, which was predominantly Muslim. Mm. Okay, uh, the Abdali side. Okay, Ahmed Shah Abdali was the leader, mm. and there were people like Hafiz Rahmat Khan, mm. the 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 ruler of Rohila Pathans, and then there were people like Shah Jahan Dola, the ruler of the state of Awadh, who was Shia, mm. but he had joined. Uh, Uh, the Muslim coalition, mm. okay, to fight against the greater threat, which was the Marathas. Okay, he knew what would uh, what it would look like if the Marathas came to power in North India. So he fought side by side with the the predominantly Muslim army against the Marathas. Okay, and then we had uh, Najib ud Dola, another yes. Pathan ruler. Yep. Okay, so the purpose was to somehow neutralize the Maratha threat. Even Shah Waliullah. had written letters to all major muslim players in the land to highlight the jat and the maratha rise because what were they doing they were simply uh, at that time they were simply taking land they were burning pillaging they were raiders marathas were basically raiders marathas were not uh, established rulers they did rule from pune Mm. right in mm. the south mm. or in central india yeah, okay yeah. they d- 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 they had an empire there no doubt but as far as north india or north west is concerned they were simply come in raid pillage burn accumulate wealth and go, go back, back go back to their okay. base they co- occupied lahore mm. they came very close to peshawar mm. marathas mm. okay um marathas had occupied delhi at times and they had committed atro- atrocities you cannot take that away from them marathas was the most devastating force in indian history in the 18th century they caused more damage to india than anyone else did i am saying this with confidence marathas destroyed the mogul empire the moguls made india a single entity of course we will claim that ashoka had done it before in mm. the ancient times he had occupied all of india he made it one of course no no doubt but recent times the recent history not very far distant from us moguls were the ones were the that first, came the closest to bring uh, it to a single yeah, entity absolutely they united india as one entity india before that was not one entity there was no such thing as such thing as india there was mm. no india mm. there was no bharat mm. okay the territory was there mm. but it was divided into different principalities mm. governing by different systems vijayanagar empire mm. in the south which was uh, hindu yeah. okay and hindu in what sense different following different deities 
diff- having different temples, different system altogether to Rajputs in uh, Rajputana, for example, mm. in Rajasthan, current day yeah, Rajasthan yeah. in this region. Uh, they were different to the Hindus of Bengal. And this is why we find, uh, you know, this is a, there is a very interesting book written uh, by Richard Eaton, Richard M. Eaton, who is an American scholar What's it called? on Indian history. Uh, the book is called The Persianite, the Persianate Age. Okay. The Persianate Age, and he discusses the history of uh, the Persian political uh, authority in India from 1000 to 1700, okay. so almost 700 years. Mm-hmm. And he talks about this, that how Hindu kings were invading other Hindu territories uh, and desecrating temples of other Hindu kings. Mm. Because temples were seen as symbols of power. Power for those respective yeah. kings. So once you demolish the temple, once you break the idol or the deity, um, then that demor- demoralizes the army and the, and the king, and the king loses power. So Hindus were doing this, right? So Marathas were doing exactly the same thing. They were going into other Hindu territories, and they were fighting. And at times, they were signing contracts, and they were in agreements with Muslims. They had peace with Muslim entities. Mm. So Marathas were not necessarily a Hindu representation of power in India in any sense. They did try to uh, revive Hindu Pad Padshahi. They called it that we want to install our own emperor in Delhi mm. um, vis-a-vis the Mughals mm. so that we can have a Hindu uh, government in India, a Hindu empire. They tried that. Mm. They even talked about it. But how Hindu were they is the question. Mm. How Hindu were they? They came with their unique form of Hinduism, which was very, very devastating. I mean, uh, you would forget, if you read about Marathas, mm. you would forget about atrocities committed by uh, Nazis. And I mean, I know the comparison is wrong. It can be anachronistic. Mm. Okay. But you would forget about atrocities committed by, committed by ISIS and Nazis and and uh, you know are they Stal- hin- Stalin. are there hindu scholars and historians who say what you say yes 100 percent. really absolutely absolutely if you read all major hindu i don't know how hindu are they i mean they are secular hindus or they're liberal hindus or whether they're hindu hindu i don't know how hindu they are mm. but they have hindu names mm. and there are uh, scholars who have talked about this so I, so do you ever foresee a situation if the situation doesn't get better yeah. for the Muslims of India, mm. do you ever see you can write you can write Sheikh Hasina off the off, off write her off, yeah. yeah? yeah, yeah. Uh, but do you ever foresee Pakistan allowing some Muslims of India to come and settle? Absolutely. Why not? If they had to, but it would be very sad if they had to do that. And I believe India is a beautiful country. Uh, it's a great country with great minds, great intellectuals, beautiful people, beautiful cultures. Okay. Uh, we want India to flourish. We want. Uh, I'm speaking as a Muslim, mm. okay, and I am. I'm very certain that the majority of the Pakistani Muslims and Bengali Muslims mm. share my sentiment mm. in this regard. We want uh, peace in India. If there is peace in India, there's peace in Bangladesh and Pakistan. Of course. Okay. We want India to be a peaceful port. We want to be able to visit India. Mm. I want the borders to be opened. There would be trade between Pakistan, India and Bangladesh. Imagine how rich these countries would become. The only reason we do not have this trade or this cordial relationship between the governments, not the people. The people love each other. Believe me, if the borders are lifted, okay, the barriers are lifted, mm. Delhi would be in Lahore mm. within, within two weeks. Mm. And Lahore would be in Delhi. Mm. Muslims from Pakistan, they would be driving through the border. From Lahore, but he also posi- but he also poses some threats. Why to, ha- to have such? Well, a- if you have peace, why would there be threats? But there can't be peace because the two very countries were founded upon the antagonism and, and the no, existential not, threat of not, each not other. Not necessarily. It it the, the the bitterness came because of Kashmir. Not necessarily. Two countries don't have to be uh, against each other, fighting each other till death. No. But they're oh. mere, but but the, but the founding of those respective states, states were based upon religious lines, and therefore it poses an existential hmm. issue. Why you can't have such as idealistic, and I'm sure as good as it may be, it also hmm. poses threats of atangwadis and terrorists and raw agents and ISI agents and all kinds of madness happening across borders. No, this is happening because of the problem of Kashmir. I'm telling you, this this all boils down to Kashmir, the Kashmir crisis. If both governments can sit down together, like Imran Khan has been saying repeatedly that if we sit down 
and we discuss but the problem is how do you discuss with someone like modi but Adnan, how do you talk to someone like amit shah but Adnan, okay. Adnan, or okay. yogi adityanath look let me just ask you let me just ask you yeah. something very honest bro yeah, yeah? Mm-hmm. how can a hand span of kashmir mm-hmm. ever legitimately be part of india it could even be independent or part of pakistan that's yes. where i see it yes how can it ever be a part of india yes it, it, could, it, it doesn't it, make sense it, it cannot, and it was annexed yeah, by force exactly so yes. it can only ever be an independent kashmir which is yeah. of late last 10 15 years yes. raising a lot more sentiments yeah. for it or a part of pakistan or let the kashmiri people decide their yeah, fate yes, yeah. let let them uh, let let the international community which is mostly sleeping when muslims are being brutalized around yeah. the world and unfortunately the, the this term international community has become uh, uh, just just a an insult term, yeah. it, it it has become an insult when mm. people when these global leaders mm. use the term international community mm-hmm. it is useless i'm mm. sorry mm. when muslims are being brutalized all over the world mm. this international community is sleeping okay mm. when when a donkey dies somewhere or when a dog i mean rightly so we need to make no we, we need to protect animals as much as mm. we need to protect um humans right but there is more noise for animals animals animal rights around the world for and some is, reason this is why muslims. muslims need to wake up globally and they're trying to wake up mm. uh, mashallah recently the kuala lumpur um summit, uh, summit was uh, a breeze of fresh air it was very encouraging the okay. muslim leaders are now realizing that they need to do something about this because which among clearly was pressure from not attending un- unfortunately unfortunately there was a mistake i, I don't think uh, the pakistani government shouldn't should have taken that course but politics is a very dirty game saudi positive yeah. that way will take away 4 million laborers of pakistan from saudi yes. and give it to bangladesh and, they, and, they, and then, they will pull out the money that they've they, that they've uh, deposited to the pakistan uh, bank and the, for that reason imran khan did not attend you're right about that but then iran was there and saudi arabia does not want to sit with pe- people i mean or, or the re- regimes like iran iran iranian regime has completely devastated the region but the neo ottoman okay. sultan yeah. erdogan was there also yes so, he was so, the, so what uh, i'm saying I, is and i i believe i believe he's a better politician i believe he's a better politician he, he knows politics okay and uh, coming back to his uh, condolences sent to iran for the loss of the general is politics i'm sure he doesn't sympathize with what he had done in syria even i'm i am very sure erdogan does not sympathize with the actions of iran in syria in yemen and in iraq so even politic so you saying even reportedly uh, referring to sulaimani as shaheed reportedly okay. is that also siyasat as well yes unfortunately it's politics so sunnis are into political taqiya then isn't it uh, it's, I, can't, it's, I, I, it's, I, can't, i i, I wouldn't I, call it taqiya it's politics is politics donald trump uh. okay uh, or or just like just like <laughs> president reagan okay yeah. uh, praising the afghan mujahideen as the as, noble as the as, and and so, uh, to to an extent that they had to make make rambo 3 yeah. to to glorify <laughs> the afghan cause okay these very terrorists were at that time okay, that was political taqiya on yeah. the part of the gov- <laughs> government's leaders always do it okay they always speak a language which they don't actually mean so okay? back to kashmir this is why hence the hence the claim that they are a bunch of hypocrites yeah, yeah. but if they are not hypocrites and mm. I'm, i'm using inverted mm. commas mm. okay then how would they govern mm. if every single leader said his mind mm. and what what is in his heart do you think he would be a leader anymore people would you know uh, you know so Do you think Trump states everything he I mean what he, is he, uh, he, No you're going to say that right? and the, you knew the answer was yes he literally does tweet everything in his mind I don't think so I think what he has inside him is far worse than <laughs> the what, what he tweets what what uh, what comes out of his mouth yes So back to Kashmir right if yeah. you're saying that a lot of the antagonism and the friction and the existential threat is because of Kashmir how can I know it's a huge topic a topic which you touched upon in a previous podcast if I brought some Islam 21 see when the whole article 370 thing was happening how can you ever sit down in a meaningful way about kashmir when you know the realistic sentiment and outcome of the people of that region will either be pakistan or independent and never india look it only makes sense as you clearly stated any sane um person looking at kashmir demographically would simply say it belongs to pakistan or an independent kashmir uh, if, if the kashmiris want, want independence that. then it should be an independent kashmir because K- kashmiris clearly don't want to be governed by india mm. uh, let alone a bjp government mm. which is uh, which has imposed a curfew which it hasn't lifted S- to still date there. unfortunately uh, this is a concentration camp yeah. and the world is sleeping again yeah. the international community mm. doesn't care about it mm. they don't care about the rohingyas 
They, they didn't care about the Rohingyas. They didn't care about uh, what was happening to uh, people in Syria, what's happening in Yemen. The the international the community. Goods. In fact, they are inflating the fire of war. Mm. They are actually pushing, pumping money and weapons into this region to inflate the conflict further. Okay, so so violence against Muslims is somehow, unfortunately, you know, tacitly approved of. It's approved. It is fine. Not enough action should be taken against this violence. But violence by Muslims, rightly or wrongly, okay, we have both problems, unfortunately. It's top of the agenda. Uh, it's top of the agenda. Mm. The Muslims cannot be radicalized. The Muslims have no right to defend themselves when they do. Uh, even the legitimate uh, movements, when they are actually fighting for the survival, and for resisting. example, and, and resisting mm. uh, genocide. Uh, I'm talking about Rohingya Muslims. Mm. They were facing a genocide. Hundreds of thousands of women have been raped. Who, who cares? Mm. In Bengali camps, go and look at them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, those women who have come Mass there, rapes. They, they, they are pregnant. Mm. Hundreds. I'm, to, I'm saying hundreds of thousands. Mm. Okay, go and watch Al Jazeera reports, mm. BBC reports, BBC which is seen to be relatively biased against Muslims, unfortunately. Mm. Okay, people think that, and I don't know how. True that is. Their uh, propaganda is far more sophisticated. It's, yes, absolutely. Yeah. BBC is the yes. most sophisticated yes. propaganda outlet in the world. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree. So, something needs to be done about Kashmir. Kashmir is a very, very disturbing case. And the world is sleeping on it. And there are two nuclear powers standing against each other. As Imran Khan warned in the United Nations, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, when he did his speech, that... It is not um, um, uh, a simple matter. You need to think about these mm. two nuclear nuclear armed states. Mm. If they were to fight each other over this territory, what would happen to the world? These are not the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These are this is different technology. Mm. Okay, this is different technology. This is a completely different game altogether. Mm. Okay, the world needs to take it seriously, just like the Iran and uh, U.S. tensions need to be taken seriously and everyone needs to calm down mm. because innocent people will die. I mm. know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, America will come with this might with all the weapons and all the missiles to try new technology on the people of Iran mm. and the people of Iraq and the people of the region mm. at large and Iran will retaliate. Who will who will die? The innocent people. people. We don't want that. We don't want wars. We want peace. We want peace in the world. That's why we hope that India comes to its senses. We hope sanity, morality, and justice prevails in India. Those people who are uh, supporting and backing the Muslim cause, and it's not the Muslim cause, by the way. This is a war. This is a battle for the soul of India. This is what the people are saying. This is a battle for the soul of India. It's the survival of India. Does India want to become a Nazi-style, xenophobic, hateful, bigoted it's already violent there. state it's already it, become, it is already it, it currently it is unfortunately yeah. or does india want to become uh, a progressive enlightened um peaceful inclusive state inclusive state that leads the world in um, in all these areas if it so, if it carries on the way it is yeah. if the trajectory continues the way it is mm. do you see the birth of Resist Muslim resistance mm. uh, who will take to arms to protect their communities. And, and if, I if hope it doesn't come to that. I really, I mean, I don't like to talk about war. I don't. I mean, I am. No, but it's a I'm not a pacifist. Yeah. I, 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 I believe in Islam. But no, but it happens in everywhere. Totality. It happens everywhere because yeah. because we we see that there were pockets of resistance amongst the Rohingya. There were pockets of resistance amongst the Uyghurs. I, There's I, resistance I, in Kashmir. I, I believe Muslims will be the victims if anything like that happens in India. And I really wish, I really hope it doesn't come to that. I really hope uh, that the current movement is successful and this government is, you know, we get rid of this government and somehow I hope it, it is voted out in the ne next election in India and someone who is sensible comes to power so that we can resolve the Kashmir issue and then reduce xenophobia in this politics of uh, hate and communalism, mm -hmm. right? I really hope that. I really hope it doesn't come to that. But if it came to that, mm. it's a big if, then the Muslims will be the victims. Okay, Muslims are a minority. They are scattered. 
They are very weak economically. Most Muslims are poor. They're very poor. And even the rich Muslims are very marginalized. They're very, very much cornered. So I hope it doesn't come to that because Muslims will be the losers in this. Okay. But again, if someone's coming to your house to your, and to trying your area, to, try, to, your try, community, try, trying to, to your rape shops. your daughter in front of your eyes, you have to defend your daughter. Mm. You have to defend your family. Mm. And Bring, I hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah. Bringing the podcast to a kind of a close, uh, you, may, you said something earlier in the podcast. You said, how Hindu were the Marathas? So I ask you, how Islamic were the Mughals? The Mughals, with exception to Aurangzeb. Okay, the Mughals were Islamic when it suited them, with with again the, with the exception of Aurangzeb. Mm. Okay, uh, other Mughals used Islam to their advantage. For mm. example, Akbar used Islam to his advantage, and then he abandoned Islam altogether. He apostatized, uh, and in fact, he was. Is there any jamal on this, by the uh, way? Absolutely. There's absolutely. a consensus that Akbar uh, was a, uh, was a murtad. Absolutely, there is historical consensus on this. I mean, what do you mean murtad? I mean, he he, he initiated a new religion called mm. Deen Ilahi. Mm. It was published on his coins. So if you look at his early coins from his uh, the, from the early part of his reign, I wish I could. Bro- I mean, uh, you you even reminded me to bring I some did. coins. I <laughs> did. Uh, but I think what what we can do in the future, inshallah, yeah. we can do a podcast. Assessing your coins. Yes, specifically yeah. uh, looking at some of the Islamic coins and history around them because there's a lot to talk about yeah. with numismatic evidence. Okay. okay, a lot. You will see theology. You will see politics in the coins. Really? Absolutely. Yeah, because minting is a representative of the of the thinking of respect. You will see uh, the, in the quality of silver. Mm. Where did the silver come come from? The messages on the coins, the propaganda, the name of the king, why, mm. the military yeah, yeah. Uh, element. Okay, coins minted. On March, for mm. example, mm. there are mints on March. The army is on the move and the coins are being minted in the camp. And there's a mint called Urdu Zafar Kareen. Okay, that means uh, the, the military mint, which is on the move. Yep. So those coins, so there's a lot to talk about. Coming okay. back to the issue of uh, How Islamic, Islamic were the Mughals. The Mughals. So Jahangir obviously made Toba, Akbar's son. Mm. And he, uh, to, la- to a large extent, he disowned his father's legacy and became a Muslim, mm. right? But how Muslim was he? He was a drunkard. Mm. He was into music. Okay. And um, he was just uh, just an Indian king. You know, when these bigots talk about Mughals being the embodiment of Islam, they don't know what they're talking about. Even the first Mughal emperor, Babur, mm. was into drinking. He, conf- he confessed to this in his Babur Nama, in his memoir, personal memoir. Humayun was an opium addict. Okay, if, uh, one of the reasons people believe he did, died was because he... Did these, was, ru- did these rulers acknowledge what they were doing was sinful? Of course, absolutely. They acknowledged this. And they were very mystical as well. They, were, they had Islam in them, no doubt. You cannot take Islam away from any of them, apart from Akbar. Mm. Apart, they all had elements of Islam to their characters. All of them. In fact, they had Ghira for Islam, mm. including Babur. Look at his coins. It has Shahada on it. Mm. Okay, mm. uh, Hamayun, the same thing, right? Akbar had Shahada and the name of the four caliphs on his coins. In ter- it, sorry, in terms of their governance, then, in terms of their governance, were it, it because they governed a largely Hindu domain. They did not impose Islam on the Hindus. Uh, Islam was never imposed. When people say jizya was imposed on the Hindus, did they have jizya? That doesn't, of course, yes, yes, jizya was there. And did they apply but to the Akbar Hindus? Akbar abolished it. Okay. Akbar ab- abolished it, and Aurangzeb reinstated it. In, did they have hudud? In 16th century. Um, partly, yes, yes, uh, they were there. Of course, uh, during the Delhi Sultanate period, Hudud were partially implemented where it was possible. Where, what about the Mughals? The Mughals is a very complicated situation. You see, uh, Mughals never got the chance to do it. Why? Because their history was full of so much turmoil. Uh, Babur only governed for four years. He couldn't. He could barely con- consolidate his power. Hamayun uh, governed for ten years, and then he was ousted by his general Sher mm. Shah Suri, mm. who was very Islamic, mm. very Islamic. So within the Muslim domain, they had Islamic principles governing them. Mm. Okay, this these principles were not imposed on Hindus. Hindus were simply left alone to govern by their own systems, as and they were vessels. They were vessels to the Mughals, right? Mm. Uh, and uh, they, they paid taxes to the Mughals like all other principalities, mm. Muslim and non-Muslim. Uh, when they became under the Mughal rule, mm. they would pay taxes to the, to the central uh, treasury, right? So as far as the Mughal household was concerned, they were governed by a mixture of Islamic 
Turkic and Persianate protocol. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, so, so, to understand so, that, you will have to read some of the books. No, because even yeah. the Ottomans. Yeah. Uh, we had this conversation uh, yeah. not too long ago yeah. uh, over Donna Kebab. Um, mm-hmm. The Ottomans also had a number of Turkic values and principles which they didn't feel was in conflict with. with when with, we say Turkic, just to clarify for the audience, not t- uh, modern day Turkey. Uh, uh, yeah. Turkic, uh, Turkic means Central Asian, Central Asian uh, protocols. Yeah, yeah, of and, course. Yeah. So there were certain, obviously, tribalistic values and principles uh, and, and that they didn't feel was in conflict with their. Conception of Islam, so they kept those things as part of their systems. Yes. In the same way in which when Umar ibn Khattab and when they took over the lands of Persia, there's certain systems which they kept. Is that, are we in agreement with that? Yes. I mean, one example in the case of the Ottomans is the strangling of all the siblings. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the fratricide. Uh, yeah, fratri- yeah, yeah, the fratricide yeah. element of the Ottoman. But the ulama system. justified that by saying uh, that the death of one prince is better than the death no, of the. No, because they what they were what they, they were actually facing devastation. A lot of these princes would completely devastate the state fighting for... No, that policy uh, was born out of the Ottoman interregnum where Sultan Murad's three sons went to war with each other. Yes. He destroyed the entire after, state. After the death of uh, Bajid, uh, yeah. yep. Sultan Bajid, mm. his three sons yeah. fought each other. And then Ottoman That's Empire yes, nearly Sultan crumbled. Bezid, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Ottoman Empire nearly crumbled. So the ulama came yeah. and, and they said, that, look, it's actually better to kill respective princes. Than but later on, the, later on, it was uh, they realized... Yeah, Sultan Ahmed was, abandoned that. Yeah, Sultan abandoned, abandoned, abandoned that and then, that. then they used imprisonment. Or exile. Of, Exile or yeah. imprisonment yeah. As, as a better option. But this option was absolutely barbaric, of okay. course. Yeah. And, and it came from the Turks yeah. rather than exactly. Islam. Yes. But they tried to Islamify it's it. Islamify it. Islamify but, it. But, but they failed. Yeah. They failed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, even they found, I mean, it, as barbaric or as uncivilized by our standards, yeah. those times were, even they had, you know, yeah. problems with this. Hold yeah. on. How, how do we rationalize yeah. Yeah. this behavior fratricide? But in the case of the Mughals who also followed... Turkic system because mm. Mughals were originally Turkic. Yeah, Turco okay. Persian. Yeah, uh, yeah Turco Persian. Um, they also had concerns about wars of succession because when the emperor would die, these sons would fight it out. They would have to, and they had this slogan, this principle they lived by. All the Mughal princes, each prince was an establishment in his, in himself. You know, some of the Mughal princes, the the provinces they governed, were larger than. Pakistan and Bangladesh put together today. Right. For example, one Mughal prince would be given Gujarat. It's a huge region. Another one would be given Deccan. Deccan is all of South India. Then one would be uh, the governor of Bengal. It's huge territory. Bengal. And, uh, are you saying that they were autonomous rulers of those uh, They were rulers? semi-autonomous. They, were, they, they, they answered back uh, to the emperor yeah. in Delhi or Agra. Mm. Okay. Uh, and they would have to obey the emperor. And if they rebelled against the emperor, the emperor would muster his might and army. He would uh, and amazingly, um, you see Hindu generals in the political and the military landscape of the Mughal Empire mm. all the way. They are always present. They are never marginalized. They are never uh, basically discriminated against in the sense that, oh, you're a Hindu. Mm. You cannot get involved in our fight. No, there were Hindu Rajas with their own armies who joined the Mughal cause. And they were, they were in some cases, they were more loyal to the Mughals than the Mughals themselves. Because a Mughal prince is fighting against father. And who's fighting the prince? Yeah. The Hindu, the Hindu, the Hindu, Hindu king. Generals, yeah. A Rajput Hindu yeah. king fighting the Mughal prince mm. for the Mughal emperor. And he's losing his own Hindu men mm. to keep the emperor on throne. Yeah. These things are not known, unfortunately, to the masses. Mm. They are brainwashed. They are conditioned. Mm. This is why history... Real history has to be taught. And you know, historians are going through a lot, a lot of trouble in India. True historians, objective historians, they can't even speak their mind in India anymore. Mm. Okay, Audrey Trusk, the lady who has written uh, this recent book on Aurangzeb Alamgir, an introduction to Aurangzeb's life. Aurangzeb uh, uh, is a very good book. It's a must read for the Muslims of India in particular, and the Muslims of the world at large. Because Aurangzeb is someone, Rahimullah, is someone who's actually consistently now of late being demonized. Yes. As an ISIS. And not ta- even now. Not I mean, uh, demonization of Aurangzeb started during the British period. But it's happening a lot now. And that... It's revived now. That historical tradition, which was very biased... That he was radical, he was extreme, he implemented Sharia laws, he oppressed Hindus, da 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 When did this narrative come about? Is the As question. you mentioned, the British period. During the colonial period, the mm. British, particularly, specif- specifically, systematically, 
created this narrative to divide the Muslims and the Hindus. So to get the Hindus to hate the Muslim past of India, they created villains like Aurangzeb and Tipu Sultan. Mm. Okay. Uh, who are two of our heroes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Muslims, they are absolutely. heroes. And then the Muslims uh, inflated their legacies mm. to counter that narrative. As a reaction to that. As a reaction to that. But the truth is in the middle. Mm. The truth is in the middle. The British narrative, unfortunately, the colonial British narrative was adopted by some early 20th century historians in mm. India, such, such as Jadu Nath Sarkar. Mm. Okay. He upheld that narrative mm. of Aurangzeb's barbarity and mm. his... Uh, his extremism and all that, mm. okay? And then later on, the BJP uh, government adopted that narrative. But the historians, the real historians, people like, for example, you know, um, Mudajar, for mm. example, uh, people like Richard Eaton, okay? F.F. F. Richards, okay? Uh, Audrey Trushk, Munis Farooqi, okay? And... Um, uh, you know, Irfan Habib, all these people, major Indian historians who have written on the history of India. I'm talking about Indian as well as Western historians. They are all unanimous on one point, that the BJP government's narrative of history is redundant. It is ahistorical. It is not history. It is bigotry. Mm. They, they are all unanimous on this. Mm. All major serious historians. They don't see history in black and white. History has trends. It has nuances, which bigotry and uh, prejudice fails to detect unfortunately mm. so for this reason we must study the history of the moguls more carefully and they were far more complex than one may think today are you saying are you then saying that for the moguls the attempt to perhaps islamize or implement sharia and implement islam was far more difficult because they were a minority always amongst a majority hindu state sorry repeat that question would you so what would you then suggest that the Ottomans were successful because for all their faults and shortcomings and, we, and, I, and whenever I discuss the topic of history in my articles and lectures I always mm. say that never do Muslims or should Muslims present our civilizations as utopia would you agree? 100% because you, once you do that yeah. there will be so many instances where it was not a utopia absolutely internal absolutely. war um, you know unjust rulers we must talk about all the atrocities committed by mm. some of the Muslim kings because it happened what we can talk about is the general pattern of the Muslim civilization exactly okay comparatively it was a trends lot patterns and themes yes. yeah Ghira yeah. and, 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 and an aspiration to rule by certain and the, pat the patronage of um, uh, civilized um, pastimes yes. for example Muslim kings in India repeatedly uh, you know provided patronage to art mm. calligraphy uh, scientific advancement mm. uh, copying of manuscripts, you know, uh, all sorts of things, uh, monuments, architecture, okay. Some of the most beautiful monuments in India uh, are Muslim uh, Muslim monuments. You know, Qutub Minar is, mm. a, is, 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 a, is an epitome of Islamic art. Again, I think historians would even testify that whether it's Mughal India mm. or whether it's uh, Abbasid Baghdad yeah. or Umayyad Andalus, mm. there was always an attempt to contribute and not just contribute but to uplift the intellectual standards of humanity absolutely right? 100% but, that was the general pattern okay, of the Muslim okay, civilization okay. but that said the Ottomans from easily from late to mid 15th century all the way up to Khalif Abdul Hamid's time there is an entire archive in Turkey where there was a strong emphasis in ruling by Islam, ruling by Hanafi um, fiqh and its codification of Sharia, etc., etc., right? And there was a massive emphasis in the Ottoman rulers, you know, re exerting themselves as Khulafa of the Islamic domains, etc., etc. You said to me off camera a couple of days ago that that journey was starkly different for the Mughals because of their demographic reality. Absolutely, absolutely. Mughals were governing a completely different world to the Ottomans. The Ottomans were predominantly ruling uh, either, Mus either Muslim the Muslims or Christians yeah. in the yeah, Christian look, in Central Europe. Asia, for example, Asia Minor mm. is predominantly Muslim. By the time Ottomans come to power, Asia Minor is already Muslim. So is North Africa, the so is the lost The Byzantines lost Asia Minor in the mm. 11th century. Mm. Okay, uh, The Battle of Manzikert yeah. in 1071. With the Seljuks. Uh, with the Seljuks, uh, Seljuks, Seljuks won the battle and mm. the Byzantines had to abandon yep. Asia Minor. Yep. So by the time Ottomans come to power in 1299, if mm. you want to 
put your but Asia on. Minor guys we're talking about uh, modern day Anato- well, Anatolia Anatolia. Anatolia Anatolia modern day Turkey yep. the, the land mass of yep. Turkey yep. right uh, because people think Turkey is Istanbul no, no it's Istanbul not. is yeah. just a it's just a dot. part that, yeah, uh, yeah. Dot on the right. European side that's exactly it. so this was already Muslim mm. right so Ottomans were predominantly governing a Muslim domain where it was needed for them to implement Islam okay mm. but with the Mughals the Mughals were governing uh, an uh, an immense landmass which land is predominantly mass, Hindu, which was predominantly Hindu. So the the Mughals have Muslims have always been a minority in this domain that governed for nearly uh, nearly uh, eight centuries. So what made Aurangzeb Rahimahullah unique to all other Mughal sultans? Okay, what made Aurangzeb, him Aurangzeb did not enforce Islam on the Hindus. This is a huge misconception. But he introduced. He did in not Islam. forcefully convert anyone. This is a lie again, mm. peddled by. BJP inspired, uh, uh, you know, pseudo historians mm. or pseudo intellectuals. Okay, Aurangzeb did not have a policy to force Islam upon anyone. He did impose jizya, okay, which in my opinion was not pragmatic for him to do that. Mm. Okay, that caused problems. But why did he do that? Historians discuss it. He did that to punish the Rajputs for their rebellions because the Rajputs. They started to rebel against Aurangzeb at that time. They found him to be weak. He was uh, involved in the south, fighting um, uh, some uh, some of the. I mean, before I mean, Aurangzeb moved to the south in the 80s, mm. 1680s. Uh, jizya was imposed in 1676, mm. right? And it was done as a response to some of the Rajput rebellions okay, as a in form the of north. In the north, as as a form of punishment, he did this. Okay. But he didn't want to convert the Hindus to Islam. But he did have an. But he did. He have an actually agent. funded temples. Did you know that? I didn't know that. From, yeah, from the state treasury, there are there are farmans. Okay. Okay. That's pretty crazy. It's it's online. Okay. If you Google Aurangzeb funding temples, you will go to a website where you will see Persian documents, original documents, where he funded the uh, the repair or the restoration of temples. Uh, and he did not, I mean, when people say he was out to demolish temples, again, this is another lie, a, mis- a misrepresentation of history. He did, if he wanted to demolish all the temples in his domain, there would be no temples in India. But he did okay. seek to kind of minimize or at least abolish things like the proliferation of drinking, opium, music, public bite, bathing. And, and these within are, the Muslim domain. Within the Muslim domain. Okay, this has to be clarified. Yeah. People think this was all over the... Uh, the no, no, within, within... No, the Hindus were still into, in fact... A scholar, she has written an article on uh, suppression of music during the reign of Aurangzeb. Mm-hmm. She has argued to the contrary, music became more of, um, of, of, of um, you know, it became more prominent as a pastime during the reign of Aurangzeb than ever before. Why? Because uh, more scholars, more musicians, more people were uh, getting involved in music uh, during the reign of Aurangzeb. One one of the incidents is cited very often to paint Aurangzeb as a as, a, as an enemy of music in mm. India. Okay, he couldn't suppress music uh, within the Hindu community. Mm. Hindus love music. So you saying okay. these things he implemented in Muslim domain? In within the Muslim domain. Okay, none of this uh, shenanigans in his court. Basically, bowing to the emperor. Mm. They called it Cornish. Mm. Basically, you bow. Uh, to the emperor and uh, you know wave your hand three yeah, yeah. times yeah. He, he abolished all that that you do not bow to anyone other than Allah mm. okay he lived a very simple life this is testified to by European travelers mm. who saw him in his simplicity it's people like Bernier people like Manucci okay who was a physician an Italian physician who was working within the Mughal court at the time uh, people like Tavernier as well we have European travelers who had traveled through the Mughal world at the time and they were completely blown away by the might and the splendor of the Mughal Empire. The Europeans at the time were so uh, shocked at the the splendor of the Mughal Empire that they had to come back and they had to tell their people, you don't know what you're losing. You need to trade with India Mm. so that you can, and then the Dutch East India Company, then the British East India Company, and then lo and behold, uh, that's another history. Uh, for to see what happened after that, you must read William Dalrymple's *The Anarchy*. His okay. new book, very very powerful book, very important. Um, although he uh, said negative negative things about Aurangzeb Alamgir in this mm. book, 
for <coughs> political reasons because he lives in India and he mm. wants to stay in India so yeah. we can give him the benefit of the doubt that he was doing it for for his safety and well-being in India mm. because Audrey Trushk yeah. uh, who was also an historian and uh, she has written this book on Aurangzeb yeah. she actually you know picked on this particular issue that why did you follow that redundant narrative on Aurangzeb in your book Anarchy which is well researched otherwise yeah. but when it comes to Aurangzeb you're painting him as a villain why is that and it is clear that he did that too to conclude on this specific issue if we were to have a comparative look at the Mughal empire mm-hmm. and the Ottoman empire and both Dola and both states and we look at the way in which they governed by the rules in which they governed in which they uh, implemented it both in the lands and domains where it was predominantly non-Muslim and Muslim Would it be fair to say For whatever contextual reasons and nuances That the Ottomans Their their governance was far more Islamic than that of the Mughals I would say Ottomans were more Islamically driven than the Mughals were I would say that, I would accept that You know why? Because the Ottomans are facing a completely different reality Their expansion was into at that time uh, non-Muslim territory, and they justified they justified their expansion mm. by using Islamic uh, literature, and Which that's Mughal- why they had to adopt this Islamic identity. Mm. Okay, to instill the passion within the forces. Okay, in India that wasn't the case because Indian forces or Indian uh, armies are far more mixed than Mi- yeah, yeah. than than Ottoman. So Indian, the Mughals were facing a completely different reality. So c- perhaps it's, it is not fair to compare the two. Uh, they both played immensely important roles Huge within roles. the making of the and Islamic civilization globally. And they both and had a lot of similarities. A, a lot of similarities. Turco-Persian heritage. They were yeah. both for Hanafi. Yes. They were both would Absolutely. identify themselves either Maturudi or Ashari. But yes. yeah, they yes. were both considered and, themselves. And Sufi inclined. Sufi inclined. Very much so. Sufi inclined. So they had the a lot of similarities. The, absolutely. Lot absolutely. Of similarities. A lot of similarities. Uh, they were far apart from each other uh, mm. geographically. But at the same time, they both both dynasties mm. are hugely important and I beg the Muslims to wake up. I beg mm. from the Muslims to wake up. Because please m- wake up. Because many study. of the challenges are yeah. relevant to our situation uh, our, today. Our situations today and please study to take inspiration from their legacies, their mm. positive legacies mm. and, and, and disown their mistakes. Completely not repeat them mm. because they made many mistakes. Sure. Okay? They did many things that we cannot own today. We cannot say, okay, these things are right. I mean... Um, so we have to wake up to our history, take lessons from their legacies mm. and take inspiration at the same time. Adam uh, Bhai for your presence, for your contribution for today's podcast. I find it very beneficial and it's always a pleasure to discuss history, especially with you. Um, every Blood Brothers podcast ends by giving three options to our guests. Uh, it was inspired by the early call of the, the Sahaba and those who used to go to new lands and say, Accept Islam, pay the jizya, or it's war. But obviously we don't do that with our Muslim guests. And I don't think things could be applied on a podcast in that way. But what we tend to tell we our guests... We don't live in those times anymore. <laughs> we may see those times again. You don't know. Maybe not in our lifetime. We may see those times again. Don't worry about the political correctness, yeah? But usually I offer an arm wrestle or a thumb war or you have to try some bond with me. Okay. I'll let you choose. <laughs> I'll go for the pan. Go for the pan yeah? I would rather not arm wrestle. Well, okay. we, do you think you'd beat yeah. me? Uh, no, I, I think I'm not. What was that, tumbaku? No, no. I, hope, I, hope, I hope not. Why would I give you that for ever? <laughs> Look like, it looked like... It's beetle nut and it's leaf. Okay, it's, guys. It's, it's, it's gora, but it's not got the tobacco this in is, This is to revive the legacy of the Mughals of India. Bismillah. Brothers and sisters, Sakhlaq here for tuning in. Uh, please share this video, like the video, leave a comment for our viewers from North America. Subscribe to the Mad Mamluks channel. Um, and until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi Blood Burma's podcast. The Fire Pit is a Mad Mamluks production. Would you eat it? Yeah. It's not much of a pawn, man. <laughs> this this, no, this, this is only the leaf and the, the no, chalia. No, no.